If you have any questions now, I would be happy to entertain them. If you have any. Yes, I'm there. Um, so, my question is obviously, uh, when I go into the churches, this has been a problem for a while, where the uh, parishioners of certain churches have been getting older and older and older, and there haven't really been any younger people coming in to replace them. I mean, I think we've started to reverse that process now. What, what do you think the problem was? What, what do you think kind of uh, contributed to that problem? Well, I, I think there, are, and it's not only true of our own communities. It's true of all communities, including Catholics and Jews and whatever. One, the first problem is ownership. This is our church, our community. That's my seat, my family. When people tell me, you know, our family built this church. Really, I didn't know that they were bricklayers and masons. <laughs> you know, so I think that's one problem. Number two, we forgot a very serious principle. Families pray together. People say, you know, my children don't want to get up and go to church. I say, do you wake them on Monday through Friday and tell them they have to get dressed and go to school? They said, well, absolutely. Why don't you do that on Sunday? It's much more important. So we need to remind people that families come to church together. Number three, I think we've made our services absolutely too long and boring. There is no reason people should come to church on Sunday for four hours. I'm sorry, that's how I feel. You come to church, if you go to liturgy on Mount Athos on the weekday services, how long does it take? Fifty-five minutes. You went to the wrong monastery. <laughs> Blame your high or who sent you. I think we did 45 minutes of the receipt. Just for the liturgy. Just for the liturgy. Yes. 55 minutes. Liturgy. Why does it take two hours and a half in the parishes? You want me to tell you why? I'll use the Greek. So they say, so Today we did matins, the liturgy, ordination, the making of a proto-presbyter in three hours. Just over three hours. I mean, those other services, because there are dialogues and speeches, the deacon speaks, I spoke, all those things. Liturgy should last an hour, hour and a half at the most. Sunday is the day that's a family day. So I think that's one of the other things. We made things too long. The next thing, and I'm forcing the changes you heard earlier into English. I have no problems with the Greek language. I'm ethnically Greek. I studied Greek. I understand classical Greek. But it's not the language spoken by young people today. I even support for the epistle reading, not only in Greek, in Slavonic, in modern comprehensible Russian, for example. Same thing with Greek. So people understand. The Word of God, which we read from Scripture, is not supposed to be a mystery. The faith is a mystery, and the mystical union between Christ and the Church, yes, but the Gospel message should be understood, and the sermon must emphasize what the Gospel is telling us, or the Epistle, or what we have to learn. Okay. So I think these are the contributing factors. I've encouraged now in parishes that when they elect new trustees or wardens, that at least two younger people be put on. And something else horrible, that at least one woman be included. We have to break that mentality of the old boys club. And I also believe in something else, and that is congregational singing in many of the parishes. Or if the choir is very nice, or if there's a good chanter, but I hate to hear someone. Uh, <laughs> it becomes, liturgy is supposed to be a beautiful experience. All you have to do is go back to those first days when the delegation went from Kiev and Rus to go into Constantinople and said, we didn't know if we were in heaven on earth. That's what the liturgy is supposed to be. And now we have in our parishes, of course, English. 
Saturday in the Archdiocesan Chapel, the Saturday of the Souls, but an all English liturgy. And we have a choir singing for that. So it's, it's a little bit unusual, and change has to happen naturally. You cannot force things. It happens naturally. Some things I can force, because nobody can tell me no. I can say, come on, it's easy. Okay, you're not serving for the next six months. <laughs> But things have to happen naturally. And these things will, but we have to push them along at times. But you see, liturgy should not take so long. It's got to be a beautiful expression. So I think those are some of the things. And finally, we need to be more welcoming in the church. Anybody who comes in, we're talking about that in the car. That there's a small community in Ipswich. I don't know if anybody's ever gone to church there. It's one of the most welcoming communities there. When you go in, you feel automatically part of them. And it's Father John Garnett, if any of you know him. Wonderful priest. You know, I think a wonderful human being has the right vision. He left the Anglican Church, gave up everything as a vicar become an orthodox. Not for gain of salary or position, but for the faith. So if we can imitate that in our communities, and I'll use a Greek word. You know what the word xenos means? Or xeni? Mm -hmm. Foreigner or stranger? It's mispronounced in English when people say xenophobia. It's not a z, a z, it's an x. Xenos. It means the fear of strangers. We often use that term for people whom we don't know. When they come to the church, who is that, that stranger, that foreigner? In the house of God there aren't any. All are welcome. And why don't people read the hymnology of the church in the words of St. Nicodemus, of course, and Joseph of Arimathea, when they go to Pilate and say, give me that stranger. It's in the hymnology of the church. Christ is referred to as the stranger. So we need to be more welcome. And I think we'll overcome some of these things. Anybody? Yes, please. Quite a stranger. You have to tell me your name and your parish. Because okay. I him I know. I'm Maria from the Russian church. Oh, yeah. Um, half Russian. I'm half right? Russian. But I spoke yeah. to you in Russian. Yes. And I, um, I guess... I don't really know where I'm going with this question, but... To me, direct it this way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just voicing my thoughts. Um, if there's a parish that doesn't really, you know, do things in English and is quite ethnic about it, then what can we do to try and change that? Cause you can do two things. The easiest one is to get up and walk away so you're not frustrated and angry. It's not worth being frustrated and angry. Okay? Because those aren't Christian feelings. You can say, I found another parish and I'm comfortable there. Uh, the other one is that you try to work through the problems. You're going to swim upstream. It's not easy. I'm doing it. But my, thick, my skin's a little bit thicker than most people's. But you have to try. You really have to. And if you feel you're not succeeding, you can say, well, I did try. Now the time has come for me to move on. You know, even in the history of the church, some of the saints dusted the, the dust from their shoes, their sandals, and said, time to move on. Remember, Christ wasn't accepted everywhere. In some places he was told, please go away. Remember the swine? Okay? But if you remember the Samaritan woman, and because of her witness, people came, you have to try. And if it's so frustrating and so difficult, you just have to say, well, I need to move on. Because the feelings that I'm uh, developing are not good for my soul. They're not good for me as a human being and as a Christian. And it will cause you problems. Perhaps psychosomatically, emotionally, spiritually. And you have to get rid of those things. Try and see where you fit in. Okay. Mm -hmm.
except for Moksa. I was thinking about how many hours you have to wait before you receive communion. I'm talking about fasting from water and food. It's the from from, from what, the night. what food? I'm sorry? Water and food. So there, there are two types of fasts. For first, for regular communion. And that's why we have the word breakfast. From the point that you go to bed at night until you receive communion. Provided, of course, you don't go to bed at 4 a.m. because you've been out partying and dancing and drinking and all this. You go to bed at a normal hour. And you should brush your teeth before coming to communion. There are some people who don't do that. Sorry. You should brush your teeth and wash your face and all those things that parents tell children to do. Okay, so that's the first one. Unless you have health issues. Let's say you're a diabetic. My mother was diabetic. She would take medication, eat a piece of toast and some coffee, and then come to church or lie down maybe for another half hour or something. It depends on what medication. Now don't tell me why take vitamin C and vitamin D. Those are not the serious medications that we're talking about. Those are vitamins and supplements and nutrients. But if you have medical issues, remember communion is there to heal us. Then there is the communion during the pre-sanctified liturgy. How many hours or how long? If the liturgy is in the evening, for example, then you should eat a light meal maybe up until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, because the liturgy will be at 7. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want you to come to church and faint. You know what St. Basil also said? He told the woman once, why do you fast so strictly? Because you're going to fall, and then how will you do the good works of God? And I'm sort of paraphrasing. So God doesn't want us to fall. He wants us to do his good works and to be strong enough to be able to do them, not to torture ourselves. And fasting, abstaining for food, one does not make you any holier. Okay? It doesn't make you any more righteous. It does not make you any more worthy of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Unless you can work it as the book of Tobit says. Fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. If you ask the average Orthodox, they don't know where the book of Tobit is. It's one of the best books. And if you've ever read, anybody ever read the life of St. Mary of Egypt? No? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. So how does it start? It is good to hide the secret of a king, but glory is to reveal the works of God. Mm -hmm. Book of Tobit. It's a great line, though, isn't it? It is good to hide the secret of a king, but glory is to reveal the works of God. Great line. Read Tobit, chapter 12. It's a, that has to do with the fasting. It's a tapestry. But fasting in itself, by itself, and I say, is only a diet. And the diet will save no one. Jesus Christ came into the world to save people. Food doesn't. Okay? I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I, I was thinking because I was attending one time and the liturgy was changing. I was present at liturgy in that time. And it was like three, four hours before I fasting. And I was still going and take communion. And it was just four hours, and I, I would start questioning, was right or not? I should prepare or not? I should be ask my spiritual father? Ask your spiritual father. But if, if you also feel that inner need, you need to go to the chalice. Not an emotional, just, you know, one of those, I feel good about it types. Because Christianity is not about feeling good. Christianity is about living Jesus Christ. It doesn't feel good religion, even though sometimes it becomes that for us. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, Daniel from the Bible, but in ethic. Um, you Which is somewhere near on the way to the monastery. Um, so, so, yeah, it yeah, like so I, I found that out. Because yeah. there's someone else here from the yeah. same place. Yeah. There, there you are. Yeah. Must have been a sale two for one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
Do you think we should get to a point in this country where there are just Orthodox churches rather than Greek Orthodox churches or Russian Orthodox churches or whatever else? If, if it does, it's going to have to happen naturally. Someone asked me about changing the name of the archdiocese, the Greek Orthodox archdiocese, and you know the reason I oppose that? You'll never probably guess the reason. It'll cost us a fortune. <laughs> okay? It'll cost us a fortune to change it. Laws in, in this land and trust and the Charity Commission are so complex and difficult, it will cost us a fortune. If you go to the church in uh, Ipswich, I think it just says St. Cosmas and Damianos, St. Cosmas and Damian Orthodox Church. There's no Greek there. Okay? And let me break the bad news to you. I have a Ukrainian parish which serves only in Ukrainian. I have Romanian priests. I have Russian priests. I have, I don't think I have any Irish priests, but I have Scots. I have English. All sorts of them. Because the church is becoming one. Okay? And I am promoting that idea of being inclusive of all people. Into the what family of orthodoxy. When we go to the government, and now I write in the letters, when I write the MPs and these people, my archdiocese of 600,000 strong who vote would like to remind you of the following. That's how I get to talk to these people. But it's got to happen naturally. Okay? I was, um, I don't know where it was. And all of a sudden they came and asked me to say the Lord's Prayer in Greek. And I said, why? I said, well, it's not necessary. Today we use 10% Greek, only just for a little bit of flavor. A little bit of Romanian, but 85% English. 85% English. The maps were all English. The liturgy was almost all English. It's happening naturally. That's what has to happen. Especially as we have clergy who can't serve in other languages, but clergy who can meet the needs of people, the real need. That's what's critical. If you know the liturgy, if you know the liturgy, then you don't have to worry about language. When I lived in Russia, I didn't, when I first went, I didn't know any Russian. But I knew the liturgy, so there was no problem. So it's knowing first who we are and what we believe. And the other things will happen naturally and progressively. But first, the, the hierarchs and the clergy need to sit down at the same table and be able to eat together, Amen. which we, we find difficult and challenging. Okay? Anyone else? Quiet group. Oh, shy. I terrorized them last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still recovering. It's okay, that's necessary sometimes. Shock therapy. Um, I, I have a similar question now. Would you need to tell me your name and your parents? Yes, sorry. Lauren from Bristol. Um, it, it, I, I guess it sort of follows um, the use of languages in this year. Mm -hmm. um, in, in sort of way. What, what is your opinion on. Um, the old calendar Christmas date. Yeah. I, I just want to hear it. And, and well, I, I, have, it on the I have parishes that use the old calendar. Yes. Yeah. Right? I have parishes yeah. that are using it. Mm -hmm. Each parish must define what's comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do have some issues and problems when people worship 13 days instead of worshiping Jesus Christ. First of all, when was Jesus born? We don't know. Most probably in the springtime. And why is that? The flocks were out at night with the shepherds. And the calendar which we have is probably four years off or so. 
So the church is master over time. Time is not master over the church. So you know that early Christians celebrated Pascha at different times? Not everybody celebrated at the same time. Some according to the Hebrew calendar, the 14th of Nisan. And then it was the, the Pope, the Church of Rome, which gave the guidance to, for it to be on a Sunday. And since then we celebrate Easter. And in the year 325 AD, the directives are set out in the Acts of the Council. People say, oh, tell me the canons. No, the canons don't say anything. You need to be very careful when we quote the canons, because we're all excommunicated. I'm telling you that now. You're all ex you are all excommunicated, I'm not. I pronounce the excommunication. But we have to be very careful. Does it make a difference when we celebrate Christmas? I don't think so. But you know what happened in the church of Serbia? They were Serbian here. So there was the council, as you know, 1922-23, having to do with the change of calendar and other things. The Church of Serbia actually voted to change to the new calendar. And the hierarchs went back, and the people revolted. Why? So they would not celebrate Christmas with a Catholic Croatian. <laughs> there you go, that's good Christianity. Mm -hmm. okay. That's why it wasn't accepted. So it doesn't matter to me. You know, what is the greeting after Easter that we use to greet each other? Christ is risen. And really, after 40 days, we stop saying that. But you know that Saint Seraphim of Sarot said it all year long. Sometimes we're caught up in the wrong things. And people get caught up in worshiping and venerating 13 days instead of Jesus Christ and his message of salvation. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. But I, I, I have parishes. I celebrated Christmas twice this year. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're one of those parishes. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. It celebrates both or? Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I celebrate Christmas New Style and I celebrated Christmas Old Style to explain you. Mm -hmm. They sang the best carols. <laughs> they were absolutely beautiful. It's a, very, it's a small group. It's only about 60 people. Mm -hmm. And they worship every Sunday in our chapel in the Ukrainian liturgy. Anybody else? One more? Yes. Well, you already had one. And that's someone One, two, three. Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to understand, like, the right place for fasting and preparation prayers and confession and stuff like that, because I think all of the priests and speakers this weekend have said, like, don't become obsessed with those things as, like, a, a rule. Start as rules, but they're still important, so what, how do we get that balance? You pick a, a perfect word, because balance is critical in Christianity. And it has to do first with relationships. And that is the balance of our relationship with God, which is the easiest. Then it's the balance of our relationship with others, community. And then the most difficult one is balance with ourselves. So, if you have a good spiritual father, that individual will guide you properly and wisely. Remember that rules save nobody. It is the essence of what you have to find. Let me ask you a simple question. Now, think in the real Orthodox mentality. How does a vegan keep the fat? <laughs> I was a vegan for four years. Mm. How do you keep the fast as a vegan? <laughs> you see? So we need to, to think about things. And you should have a prayer life. But don't become so obsessed that oh, 8 o'clock I have to go start my prayers. The church doesn't work that way. The church tells you when you find the appropriate time, when you have quiet, when you have peace, 
That's when you pray. Or when you're turbulent, that's another form of prayer. But there is a saying also, of course, the same sing in the New Theologian. Don't even ask for a glass of water to drink it, because your spiritual father knows the time. That, of course, is for monasteries. And we've been greatly influenced by monastic communities in, in how we live as Orthodox Christians and the ascetical life. But monasteries are not parishes. Parishes should not become monasteries. And then the last thing is, in Jesus Christ there is something else, which is freedom. He came to set us free from the law. And we become filled by grace. Don't concern yourself with the letter of the law find the essence and that essence is Jesus Christ and his message of peace. That's all I can tell you. I'll, I'll tell you one last thing. In India, because I lived in Asia for 11 years. So I lived in Hong Kong and oversaw Southeast Asia. A father once said to someone, how can you preach to me about Christianity when my child is dying of starvation. We need to confront ourselves with those realities. That's why I told you, how can I as a male and 11 other males talk about all the problems of women? I never have those issues or problems. I'll never be pregnant. I can't deal with those problems. I don't know anything about them. They're beyond my comprehension and some my ability to think about them. But what we have to do is know our world and live within that world and find peace in Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. I guess that's it then. So, thank you everyone. Thank you, Andrea. I'm sorry, I will be heading back to London now for, for something else. I, uh, schedules always change. I was saying earlier, last week I was in Qatar on the conference for hate speech, then I flew to Athens for a day, then to Thessalonica for two days, then to make it back here for something. Next week I live for, be for Poland, but I have to be back by Friday night because we have the English liturgy on, on Saturday morning, and it's Pentecost weekend. And it is the time when we remember when the Spirit came down and gave grace and the ability to communicate and to preach the Gospel in languages. It is not the languages of babbling that some people might think, but the languages that are, can be comprehended and understood so the truth is preached to all the world. Okay? Will you have liturgy here tomorrow, Father? We will do. I know you had asked me about something good. That's impossible. We, we also have the shortage of clergy, too, and yeah. These are the realities. And young men, no offense to the women, should consider becoming priests. We need priests in the church. I always tell young people, think about becoming priests. We need priests. And you can hold a lay profession and still be a priest. St. Paul was a tent maker. Yeah, really? Believe that? St. Paul made it. Or St. Peter. Fisherman. No degrees in theology, and yet the greatest theologians the world has ever known. Okay. I guess we can stop the camera too. We have to the camera.